This is an AP and a lateral radiograph of the distal forearm and wrist from a child. And we can see that the patient's in a back slab. There's plaster shadowing at the dorsum, but it's not present on the volar surface. The injury that's present is a fracture of the distal radius and ulna. And it's seen there on the AP radiograph and here in the lateral view. Is this the radius on the right here, Jim? That's the radius, and you can see that it's a child because we've got a growth plate, the epiphysis, present there. So this is part of the same bone here, is it, on the end? It's just that there's a growth plate in between the two? That's and correct. the same here? And the same with the ulna, that this is the head of the ulna. So how will you treat this fracture? Just leave it in the plaster? In this case, I think, <coughs> I think it'd been manipulated into that position having previously had an angulation and it can then be held in a plaster cast and uh, usually about uh, five weeks would be an appropriate period of immobilization. And you would expect good healing after about five weeks? Enough to leave free of plaster and then the full strength will return over the subsequent weeks. This radiograph illustrates a skyline patella view it's taken with the knee in flexion and the x-ray beam is shot through particularly to look at the undersurface of the patella to see whether that's congruent. In this case there's been some trauma and this patient sustained a fracture of the patella. Closer inspection shows that it's not a single fracture line. The most obvious fracture line is here but there's also a second fracture line there. One of the fractures has a marked step in the articular surface and the other is more congruent. And we'd be particularly concerned about the effect of this if it was left. Presumably that would affect the joint and cause osteoarthritis if it was left uneven. That's correct. An uneven surface from a fracture within a joint predisposes to osteoarthritic change. How would this be treated, uh, Jim? Well, the first thing would be to take some more radiographic views and to thoroughly assess the fracture. And then uh, I would uh, normally undertake an open reduction and internal fixation of some form for this fracture. And then um, what's this bone here we're looking at? This is looking at the femoral condyles um, in the skyline view. This radiograph is a lateral view of the ankle in a patient who sustained a twisting injury to the ankle. The result of that twisting or rotational force is to generate a spiral fracture and you can see that that's present in the lateral malleolus. The fracture line passes through there. So the fracture line is actually passing in and out the plane of the picture here, is it? We're looking at the uh, fracture in the lateral view and it's a, a rotational or spiral configuration of the fracture. Of course, a, an anteroposterior view would give more information. And do these normally heal reasonably well? Or? The most important thing in the first stage of assessment is to see whether the ankle mortis is intact or not. What's the ankle mortis? That's the uh, conformity of the joint to see whether the shape of the mortis formed by the medial malleolus the tibial plafond and the lateral malleolus corresponds to the shape of the talus. And if that mortis is opened up by a fracture, then that needs to be restored. What you can see here is a spiral fracture of the distal tibia. Even though we're looking in a single plane with this radiograph, I think you can see that the fracture has a spiral configuration indicating a rotational type of injury. Yeah, it seems to go behind the bone here and come round the front. And That's right. Yeah. It's gone as a spiral and it's caused by a twisting mechanism. The other thing to note is that this isn't a fresh fracture and we can see some formation of callus. Does the fact that it's a spiral fracture have implications for healing? Yes, spiral fractures are usually of fairly low energy, 
and uh, they tend to heal quite quickly. They are prone to deformity and one must in, in particular correct the rotational alignment of the limb. So how would you fix this particular fracture normally? Well, I think this is one of those difficult ones where uh, people would differ in the, the method that they chose, but it could be treated conservatively in a plaster cast following manipulation, or it could be treated by a, a more aggressive form of treatment such as a, a method of fixation, either internal or external. So if you were treating it conservatively, would you need to um, apply pressure downwards to restore the alignment first, uh, and then, then apply a plaster cast after that, some traction initially? The uh, force can be applied during the operation under an anaesthetic, and the plaster cast applied to the patient while asleep. Uh, this can be done at the time of injury or the next day. When a bone is fractured, it produces at least two pieces. If it produces three or more, then the fracture is described as comminuted. And here we have a nice example of a comminuted fracture. This is an AP radiograph of a distal tibia and fibula. The proximal tibial shaft is coming in here, and it should be in continuity with the distal tibia here coming down into the ankle joint. We can notice this segment is very disrupted by fracture, and there are many pieces. So this is actually a free-floating, as it were, a part of a tibia? That's correct. There's a large fragment here, which I think is probably split into two itself. There's another fragment there. This fragment's partly separated there and I'm sure there are more bits and pieces if we were to open it up. So clearly healing in this type of fracture would be much more prolonged than in a, uh, an ordinary transverse fracture. This represents a high energy injury, and high energy injuries have disruption of the blood supply and delayed healing. So there's damage to surrounding tissues as well as more severe damage. To the That's body. very important, that the fracture is not just the bony injury, but it's a whole limb injury. I'd like to illustrate a butterfly fragment. This radiograph is of a humeral fracture. The overall configuration is a spiral type of fracture. A rotational type of injury has caused it. But the fracture has at least three pieces. The proximal shaft, the distal shaft, and a large comminution fragment, which appears to be a single fragment, and we would call that a butterfly fragment. So this is really the, the simplest type of comminuted fracture where there's one single fragment. That's correct. Two ends. It's really a fairly low energy of injury and I would expect it to heal well. This radiograph should never have been taken. What we can see is a great deformity of the limb. And one of the basic principles of fracture care is that gross deformities are straightened and splinted uh, prior to assessment with radiographs. So that, there should be a reduction of the limb first? That's correct. This applies particularly to dislocations like fracture dislocations of the ankle and also to femoral fractures which should be put in a Thomas splint in the emergency room before they're taken to x-ray. So there should have been some traction to pull this uh, broken shaft down? Yes, the patient should be given some analgesia usually intravenous opiate is necessary and then the limb is pulled to length by some force on the lower leg and a Thomas splint is applied. Following that the patient will be much more comfortable and the x-rays will be much more meaningful. So you would just uh, apply that traction physically by pulling the ankle at the bottom of this leg to straighten it out? Yes, it's sim simply a longitudinal traction that can be applied and no great skill is required. Certainly a severe looking fracture. Well, what's this area here, Jim? Yes, we can see a, a marked soft tissue shadow. It looks a bit like a rugby ball here. And that's because the limb is very flexed up at the point of the fracture. And it's giving a, a deformity with a double superimposed soft tissue shadowing. The hip itself is quite rotated with the hip flexed up. And that's why we have this odd appearance here of the proximal fragment. So presumably uh, quite a lot of this might be blood as well from the hematoma from the bleeding ends of the, ends of the shaft? Yes, there'll certainly be uh, a good amount of bleeding in there. How much blood could this patient have lost in fact? 
Well, I think this is a child from the uh, appearance of the growth plate, and uh, in a child, perhaps uh, half a litre or so for a femoral shaft fracture. Which is a significant percentage of the blood they have in their body. That would be a, a significant insult, yes, and would require a drip. This patient may well be clinically shocked. It's possible. If this is an isolated injury, uh, maybe not. But uh, if there are other injuries, then certainly yes. These radiographs illustrate the value of taking uh, two planes at 90 degrees. We've got the anteroposterior radiograph here on the left, and then on the right we've got a lateral view of the same uh, left elbow. Is there any fractures on, in this uh, injury joint? I can't see any fractures, but there's certainly a dislocation of the elbow joint. Now to the trained eye that would be quite obvious on the AP view, but to the less trained eye it would be far easier to spot it in the lateral view where clearly the elbow joint itself has dislocated here and it should be in continuity there with the humeral condyles. It's very clearly dislocated here isn't it? You get the impression there should be something in there. That's right, this is a posterior dislocation. And how would you check that for, for fractures if you just to be on the safe side? Yes, it's important with an elbow dislocation to check for fractures. The one that's uh, most associated would be a fracture of the medial epicondyle here, which can be taken off with the fracture and then it can become stuck in the joint, particularly uh, after reduction of the dislocation, the fragment can fall into the joint line where it will certainly cause problems. So always check around the contour for the normal contours, especially that medial epicondyle. So a bone fragment in a joint is really quite a nasty uh, Definitely to be avoided. Yeah. It will reduce the range of movements, and if it's untreated, it would lead to subsequent degenerate change. Arthritis and things like that. Yes. Mm -hmm. Would it be painful? Yes, I'm sure it would be uh, one to avoid, I think. Indeed. We're now illustrating an oblique fracture. It's actually in the shaft of a femur, and we're looking at it from the lateral view. The other thing to note is that there's this piece of metal work here which is a Thomas splint and I'm glad to see that that's in place. Regarding the fracture itself, it's not one that passes at 90 degrees to the cortices, which we would call a transverse fracture, but you can see that it's at an angle. And once that angle is more than 25 degrees, we would usually call it an oblique fracture rather than a transverse fracture. How can you tell it's not spiral? We can tell that by the uh, length of the fracture that a spiral fracture would normally extend for longer and also by looking at the fracture being in a single plane and obviously the further view in the uh, anteroposterior x-ray would help us to see this. Is this a bone fragment here? Yes, that's a common muted fragment or a small butterfly fragment. Will that heal into the rest of the bone or would that need removed? Or that can be left and uh, will heal on, almost certainly. Anyone who's worked in casualty on a Friday or Saturday night has almost certainly seen this injury. It's known as the boxer's fracture, or fracture of the fifth metacarpal neck. And you can see the fracture there with some angulation in, in the typical pattern. It's caused almost always by a punch injury although patients often come in with a different story. Indeed. So it can occur on any of the other hand bones? It's less common on the other hand bones, it's nearly always on the fifth, and sometimes associated with the fourth as well. We've now got two views of the hand, the AP view and the oblique view. The main feature to note is that the fracture is slightly angulated, and the patient should be assessed clinically, in particular for a rotational deformity of the little finger. This is unusual, but if present, it should be treated. A small angular deformity such as this uh, is very forgiving and needn't have any aggressive treatment. So normally I would treat this with companion strapping between the little and ring fingers and allow early mobilization. 
Well, in this film, Jim, I recognise the uh, shaft of the humerus here, and this looks uh, rather messy, and I think that's probably the head of the humerus there, isn't it? Yes, that's right. Messy is not quite a term that we use, but uh, there's a fracture at the point where you describe the mess, and it seems to have more than one fragment. There's a separate piece there, there may be more. So, so it's, it's a bit spot. comminuted, isn't it? It's of the proximal humerus, or the surgical neck of the humerus. The other thing I notice is this is almost certainly an elderly patient. We can look at the general bone quality, and uh, these bones might be said to have an osteopenic appearance. So that's not really osteoporosis, it's just demineralization with age that we're looking at here. It's a rather non-specific term, which is because we can't diagnose osteoporosis from an ordinary x-ray. So if we suspect it, or suspect that there might be osteomalacia, then we could say that the bone has an osteopenic appearance. So we're just looking at rather thin, uh, thin bones. That's right, loss of cortex, thin bones, poor bony architecture. And that would make the fracture more likely, presumably. The bone would be, uh, wouldn't be as strong as in the younger person. That's right. This fracture is commonly associated with elderly people with osteoporosis. So would you actually classify this as a pathological fracture? Well, strictly speaking, one could, although generally in common, uh, common description of fractures we wouldn't say so. And the use of the term pathological fracture is more commonly reserved for fractures through tumours or through bone cysts or through uh, bone weakened by some other uh, method. This gentleman was riding his bike through town, John, and unfortunately a car didn't see him. And off he went and uh, landed on the point of his shoulder, sustaining this injury. So the force has come in this direction, presumably. Yes, the force has gone up the length of the clavicle and resulted in a fracture there. So I can see several fragments in the clavicle here. It looks. Uh, would, would that be comminuted? Yes, there is some comminution here. I think there's at least one fragment there at the fracture site. But clavicles heal reasonably quickly in most cases. They certainly do in children. Uh, Mid-shaft fractures of the clavicle, such as this, do have a significant rate of non-union, and some people quote that at about 10%, and I would warn a patient that there is a risk of that. Nonetheless, that still leaves the majority healing well. So for the 10% where there is non-union, you'd probably consider some surgical intervention? That's related. correct. We would try to treat it conservatively if possible, and if that fails, then uh, the patient could have bone grafting and stabilisation with a plate or some other fixation. So we just use a broad arm sling for this or would you use some more, more treatment than that? Yes, a broad arm sling, initially under the clothing in the first week and then following that out of the clothing for another uh, two, three, four weeks until the pain's beginning to settle. So the sling really would just be taking the traction effect off the, uh, the, the shoulder? The idea of the broad arm sling in this situation is particularly for pain relief and to take the uh, weight off the shoulder by supporting it at its point. On well, this film, Jim, I recognise the line of the distal tibia and uh, I get the feeling there should be something here. It certainly should. That's where it should articulate with the ankle joint. And this patient has a fractured dislocation of the ankle. I would quibble with the fact that it's been taken at all, and these injuries should be treated in the casualty by uh, reduction of the dislocation and then splinting in a back slab prior to x ray at all. So, this would be fairly obvious from your clinical examination. There would be marked deformity of this, and uh, of course, the patient would give a history of, of recent injury. And presumably the traction to the foot and the restoration of the alignment would be uh, relieve the pain for the patient. The patient would be much more comfortable and all the tensions then taken off the soft tissues. The particular danger is to the skin. You can just see a soft tissue outline here. And this skin here around the medial malleolus is very, very stretched. And that can give us problems later on. So that could almost result in this fracture here being, being opened. It's not so much that it 
becomes an open fracture, but there can be later skin necrosis and breakdown, particularly around the medial malleolus. On this plate, I noticed that the uh, top of the femur looks uh, reasonably intact. Um, this certainly looks abnormal to me. I'm not sure if there's some distortion of the uh, inner rim of the pelvis. Yes, this man was driving his car and he didn't wear his seat belt. And uh, when he collided with another car, he was thrown forward and his right knee hit the dashboard, forcing the femur uh, right back. And he's, what's happened, he's taken off the posterior wall of his acetabulum, the cup here for his hip joint. So the hip has moved out of its joint and taken off this fragment from the posterior wall. We could get another view, uh, a lateral view of the hip, which would show the position that it's lying, and I'm sure it would lie posteriorly. Is this associated with a lot of hemorrhage, like you normally expect from pelvic fractures? The particular concern with this injury is the large structure that lies behind the hip, which is a sciatic nerve. This man had a high energy injury of his tibia when he fell from a height. Unfortunately, it hasn't gone on to heal successfully, and he now has a non-union. You can see the features of this on the x-rays, and I think the lateral view is particularly clear. The fracture line in the tibia is still very, very obvious. There's also marked sclerotic change on either side of the fracture. Does that just mean degeneration of the bone? Yes, this is where it's losing its vascular supply and becoming sclerotic. That's not active healing sort of bone, but it's a dying bone that's unable to form a union. So there's no particular evidence of callus formation across this fracture? No, there isn't any. And, and the other thing to note is that the fibula itself has joined. This is seen best in the AP view. And the fibula fracture has healed successfully. And that may indeed be one component in reducing the healing potential of the tibia because it's acting as a, a strut that holds the, uh, the tibia apart and prevents compression of that fracture. So how long ago roughly would it have been since this injury was sustained? This man's had this injury for some time, nearly a year now. And associated with that, we've got some features of disuse in the uh, limb below. And there's an abnormal quality of the bone in his uh, hind foot and midfoot seen there. Working in the West, we're very familiar with this type of picture, and it's usually Mrs. Smith in her 80s who had a bit of a dizzy turn and fell over and sustained the hip fracture. So it's the neck of the femur here, isn't it? That's, that's correct, yes. It's below the, the ball of the hip joint. The fracture's gone through there on the ball, or here's the uh, neck remnant on the proximal femoral shaft. This is what we call an intracapsular fracture. It's within the capsule of the hip joint. It's displaced and uh, it results in a disruption of the blood supply to the head of the femur. So the head of the femur could become avascular and possibly necrose. That's right. And for that reason, we normally discard the head of the femur. And in the elderly patient, we put in a hemiarthroplasty or half a hip. This uh, fracture of the femur has been immobilized in a Thomas splint. You can see the markings there on the x-ray. And I'm pleased to see that that should always be applied in the accidents and emergency department. So if you had reasonable grounds to suspect a fractured femur, it would be quite reasonable to put a Thomas splint on that patient? Yes, it would. There's nothing lost if you made an error in the diagnosis. And there's a lot gained if you're correct. It's very good for pain control and it may reduce hemorrhage to some extent by preventing the fracture from moving around as much. So any clots that did occur at the end of the bone would be stabilised and 
prevent further hemorrhage. Yes, it's not a rigid way of immobilizing the fracture, but it, it does reduce the amount of mobility, uh, movement of the fracture. And then once the fracture had been fully assessed, you could think about some more permanent type of treatment. Yes, these fractures, these fractures can be treated with uh, traction or with a form of uh, operative intervention and fixation. We're now looking at the left hand, and you can see because there's some arrows on the radiograph to help us that there's an injury to the index finger in the proximal phalanx. And there's a fracture there in the mid part of the phalanx, and it's quite comminuted. There are a number of pieces, and you can probably just make out that there are some fracture extensions coming towards the joint, although I'm not sure that they actually disrupt into the joint. And how would this be managed normally, Jim? First of all, I'd like to assess the uh, soft tissue injuries and check for any neurovascular injury associated with it or any open fracture. Following that, uh, the finger could be straightened with a use of some simple anesthesia like a ring block, which is local anesthetic applied at the base of the finger to uh, anesthetize the digital nerves and the finger could then be held either by taping it to the middle finger or by the use of a splint. Would you apply traction first to restore the alignment? Yes, the most important thing is to uh, produce correct rotational alignment but also to avoid angular deformities. Well, clearly dislocation here I think, uh, Jim. Yes, it is a dislocation. I can't see any obvious fracture associated with it. And how would you manage that? I would give this patient a ring block of local anesthesia at the base of the finger to anesthetize the digital nerves. And it's important to wait while that works, let the finger get properly numb, and then a good pull on the end of the finger will reduce that posterior dislocation. So it would almost snap back into position, really? Yes. You pull longitudinally to get the length. And when the length is restored, the distal phalanx can slide back over those condyles in the middle phalanx and back into place. And I imagine after that the patient would uh, feel much better? The patient will feel more comfortable and uh, be thankful that they came for your help. This young child was climbing a tree and unfortunately fell out landing on his right hand and sustained this injury to the forearm. You can see that both the forearm bones are fractured and there's quite an obvious uh, angulation at the fracture site and the patient had an obvious deformity when looking at the limb. So by angulation you mean that that, that is angled? And presumably that should be straight aligned there with the bones and it's angled to the... Yes, the forearm bones aren't perfectly straight in normal life, but if we follow the line here, we're following the radius, you can see that at the point of the fracture there, it suddenly takes a bend and angles dorsally. And that's uh, something that needs to be corrected by a manipulation and then immobilized in a plaster cast to maintain the correction. Would you classify this as a, as a, as a green stick fracture? Yes, it is a green stick fracture. Certainly of the radius there, the fracture of the ulna actually seems to be quite disrupted. It's a bit closer to being an adult sort of fracture. And the growth plates look reasonably closed on this, uh, on this child. I think this child's still got quite a bit of growth there. This fracture would be referred to as a Collie's fracture. It's a fracture of the distal radius, and the patient presents to the casualty department with a dinner fork type of deformity of the wrist. Is Collies named after a man, or does it, just, just, does it describe the anatomy? Collies is named after a man. I understand the correct pronunciation is actually Collis, and he was a Dubliner, as was Smith, who also described a fracture of the distal radius. But in the Smith's fracture, the deformity is in the other direction. 
So the fracture line is... Yes, it's seen quite nicely in the lateral view. This is the fracture line through the distal radius. The angle of the articular surface is now lying dorsally angulated by some 20 degrees. It should be 5 to 10 degrees in the volar plane. So there's quite a lot of deformity that has arisen there. There's also a little bit of dorsal displacement and there's some uh, radial angulation and shift as well. Would you like to treat this conservatively? In most instances this can be treated satisfactorily conservatively. Uh, the fracture should be reduced and then immobilized in a Collie's type of short arm cast which should be well molded to try and maintain the reduction. So normally traction to the hand to restore the alignment and then the plaster the cast after that? Yes, there are different methods of reducing the fracture but the essence of it is that the patient should be anaesthetized adequately either by general or regional anaesthesia and then the fracture fragment should be hitched back on and brought round into its normal position. This looks like fairly extensive skull fracture in Jim, uh, along here, and then again uh, another line along there. Yes, there is, and uh, we'd certainly want to assess this patient carefully regarding their level of consciousness with the Glasgow Coma Scale. And if there was a problem, we'd be uh, transferring to a neurosurgical centre. So the risk is some sort of int intracranial bleeding, maybe extradural hematoma? Yes, there could be associated with that, and uh, if the resource is available, then we can look for this with a CT scan. So the, the key initial management would be a consideration of what's happening to the brain, but by the Glasgow Coma Scale. Yes, the first thing with a head injury, like other injuries, is to make sure that the patient is fully assessed and to see whether there are any other injuries to ad adequately treat any shock and hemorrhage. To, and uh, any problems with the, the airway and the breathing so that at least the patient is well perfused and blood is properly oxygenated. Having done that, we can then con concentrate on the head injury itself, assess it and treat it as appropriate. Would there be any risk of uh, meningitis with this sort of skull fracturing? This particular individual had a closed skull fracture. There was no break in the skin and uh, there's no fracture at the base of the skull and so in this case no not unless the, the fracture is subsequently opened. So with skull fractures antibiotic prophylaxis would only really be indicated if it was an open fracture? Yes the ones you have to watch are the base of skull fracture and that may present with uh, the passage of clear fluid through the nose or through the ear and we should always look for that. So they would essentially be an open fracture because of the communication between the fracture and the nose or the ear? Yes, any fracture is an open fracture if it communicates with the outside world. That doesn't matter if it's using the nose or the ear as its passage, it still communicates with the outside world. So this is the same fracture we've just looked at, Jim, from another angle, the fracture line running along there, I think. Yes, that's it, yes. Is this, is this just the normal suture line along here? That's quite normal. The thing to remember with the skull is that there are normal suture lines and normal vascular markings. And we have to spot the fractures in amongst those. So assuming there was no damage to other soft tissues like the brain, for example, in this area, um, would that heal reasonably well? Yes, we don't need to worry about the bony healing in the skull unless there's a depressed skull fracture, for example. But these type of injury, the, the bone heals well, but the importance, as you say, is the uh, contents of the, the box, which is the brain. I suppose the actual fracture line is supported by the adjacent skull because it surrounds it. Yes, it's well supported. It won't move out of place. It won't displace, and it will heal quite quickly. We're now looking at a lateral view of the thoracic spine and this patient sustained a hyperflexion type of injury and there's a wedge compression fracture of that thoracic vertebral mark by the arrows. What you notice is that there's a loss of height 
at the front or the anterior part of the vertebral body, but the posterior part is of normal height. So, so that, that distance there is normal. That would be normal, and this one is considerably compressed. Yes, it is. I've got a vertebral body with me here, and what's happened is there's a force apply where my fingers are here at the front of the vertebral body by a hyperflexion type of injury. And that height there has been reduced, but the height at the back of the vertebral body has remained normal. This is almost certainly a stable injury. So it's a good example of a crush fracture. Yes, you could call it a crush fracture or, or a, a wedge compression fracture would be the term I would use. So it would be painful but not really threatening the vertebral column, the, the spinal cord itself. Yes, the important thing with spinal fractures is to assess whether they endanger the neurological structures of the spinal cord. And we have to decide whether it's a stable injury or an unstable injury. And, but this would be stable. And this would be a stable fracture. So the patient would... So we'd be able to mobilise this patient as pain allowed. And it would heal fairly, fairly well? It would almost certainly heal well, and I wouldn't expect uh, ongoing problems with this patient. This rather elderly patient complained of pain in the lumbar spine and you can see that there's a fracture there and it's almost certainly a result of osteoporosis. There's quite a lot of loss of height at the front of the vertebra but I think the height at the back of the vertebra is still normal and would be the same as that of the vertebra above and below. So almost certainly this would be a stable type of injury. When we receive a patient with significant trauma and casualty, having gone through the ABC of airway, breathing and circulation, we then take the normal first series of trauma x-rays. And this includes the cervical spine, just a lateral view at this stage, chest radiograph and the pelvic uh, x-ray. We've got here the lateral view of the cervical spine. This view is actually incomplete. If we count down the vertebrae, through one, two, three, four, five, six. We can see seven to its lower border, but we can't see T1. So we don't know if there might be an injury there with a step. Otherwise, there's no obvious abnormality on this radiograph. Again, clearly vital to establish this is intact because of the risk of neurological damage. Yes, we're talking about patients with significant trauma. We have to have a high index of suspicion of cervical spine trauma because we potentially give this person life-threatening or uh, risk of paralysis uh, if we should handle them wrongly. So insubstantial trauma before cervical damage is, is eliminated, you'd like to keep a cervical collar on these patients presumably? Yes, certainly in the UK they normally arrive to the casualty department with a hard collar which has been placed by the paramedics. Uh, if this hasn't been done, then it should be done on receiving them in the accident and emergency department. And that should remain in place until somebody who is uh, trained in the management of trauma is happy with the assessment of the cervical spine. So once you'd assess the cervical spine was okay, and preferably the first uh, thoracic vertebrae, you could authorise removal of the uh, cervical collar. Yes, if the patient's alert and fully conscious, then we can often be governed by the fact if they've got very good head control and uh, can move the neck without problems then that's always a good guide that there isn't an unstable type of injury although there may still be an injury there but it's not likely to damage their spinal cord. So this is a sort of injury that could go unrecognized in an unconscious patient? The patients that we're very concerned about are those with, who are unconscious it implies a head injury and that uh, gives a high risk of damage to the adjacent spinal cord and, and the uh, cervical spine, which obviously supports the, the skull. So damage to the cord at this level will cause complete paralysis? Yes, uh, very high damage in the upper cervical spine, where it's above the uh, supply for the diaphragm, causes death. 
and uh, a lower cervical spine injury causes uh, quadriplegia or, or complete paralysis. So very important that these injuries are, are prevented, obviously. Yes. We're now on the second of the series of trauma x-rays and it's the chest radiograph. Although you will notice that this isn't from a trauma situation because this is a PA erect uh, radiograph whereas the initial trauma one is a supine view. The main reason we do this is to look for a pneumothorax or a uh, large hemothorax and hopefully we'll have diagnosed a pneumothorax clinically and treated it beforehand but we may have missed it and this is an, an extra checkup. So certainly here the lung fields look to be uh, complete. That's right, the markings within the lung fields extend right to the outer border of the chest. There's no uh, dark shadowing representing a pneumothorax around. So we're looking at a normal chest radio. So this is a normal picture. We're now on the third of our series of basic trauma x-rays and we're x-raying the pelvis. This picture is centered a little bit low, really focusing on the hips. And we'd rather focus a bit higher up so that we can look at what's happening at the sacroiliac joints. The reason we place such a high priority on the pelvic x-ray is that we're looking for a source of major hemorrhage and if there's a significant fracture of the pelvis then the patient is likely to be in uh, hemorrhagic shock. So it's really the pelvic bones uh, you're looking at? We're looking at the bones, we're looking at the joints as well, the sacroiliac joints here <laughs> and the pubic symphysis. If there's separation of the symphysis the pelvis may have opened out and that can give rise to a lot of hemorrhage. We're looking at a fracture in the tibia and the pattern of this fracture is transverse. It goes straight across at 90 degrees to the cortex. There is a little bit of comminution in this fracture, but the overall pattern is transverse. So we classify it as transverse because the angle is less than 25 degrees. Yes, if it was more than 25 degrees, then we would say that it's an oblique fracture. It's several weeks now since this fracture, and I'm pleased to say we can see some signs of bone healing. There's some bridging callus there posteriorly. Not so much to see anteriorly. And certainly the fracture line is still prominent. So I wouldn't be happy to leave this unsupported without a cast. But I would be encouraged that it's likely to go on to a union. So normal callus formation for the stage of healing. Yes, this is I think six weeks since this patient injured the uh, tibia. And that's probably about normal at this stage. Well, clearly looking at a, a bit humorous here, Jim, and uh, the fracture, and a lot of displacement there. It is completely displaced, isn't it? This is an extension type of supracondylar fracture. In this case, we're seeing it in an adult, but it's very common in children, uh, particularly from summertime when they tend to fall out of trees and fall off bicycles and things. I found this interesting radiograph of a child, almost looking at the whole body. Um, I'm not quite sure. What sort of age would you think looking at this? This is quite a small child, isn't it? I think probably about two years old. Mm. And it's being held in place by, you can see the adult's uh, fingers and the adult ring there. Yes, the child can, in place. Yes. Uh, office, obvious point, the, gro the growth plates, the epiphyses here, are very pronounced. Where the uh, cartilaginous bone is becoming, there's growth in bone and the cartilaginous bone is becoming ossified. That's right, bone forms first as cartilage and only later is it ossified. And we have to have an understanding of that to interpret x-rays in children.
otherwise things like a normal ball and socket joint, if we look perhaps at this left hip joint here, it might not look like a ball and socket joint at this time, but that's because the ball is all almost all cartilage at this stage. So at this stage of the shaft of the bone is mostly cartilaginous as well? These are beginning to ossify and the cartilage doesn't show on the x-rays but the bone does and we quite clearly see the shaft of these bones and there's uh, bone formation there. So progressive oss ossification and bone growth from the epiphyses? That's correct. And the lungs there you can see quite clearly as well, the darker lung shadows look quite normal, I'm not an expert but look quite normal to me. Yes, there's the lung shadows and between them a nice uh, outline of the cardiac shadow. Mm. And looking through that we can see the spine. So here we're looking at a radiograph of a child, probably about two years old, judging by the uh, epiphyseal plates, the growth plates. We can see the rib cage, the cervical spine, the thoracic spine, the darker lung fields on both sides, and I think clearly there we can see the heart shadow. So the area filled there by the heart in the child's chest. We're now looking at an x-ray of the femur of a young child and it illustrates nicely the healing of a previous spiral fracture. We can't really see the fracture line now because callus has bridged the gap and at the end you can see abundant callus forming a nice sound bony union. I'm sure this child now has no difficulty weight bearing and is running around without any complaints. A general rule of thumb for healing of femoral fractures in children is that they take one week more than the years of the child. So if you have a, a three-year-old, then you expect to keep them in traction for about four weeks. So that the bone will remodel and uh, go back to the normal looking femoral shape in time? Yes, that will take a little bit of time, uh, but it will remodel to, to normal shape. So a good example of callus formation? Yes. This child sustained a transverse fracture of the left femoral shaft. You can see that the line of the fracture is almost at 90 degrees to the line of the axis of the bone. There's also quite marked shortening. The bone edges have displaced completely and shortened by nearly two centimetres. So you can see, that, see why clinically this leg might look shorter than the other leg? Yes, we could probably just detect that amount of shortening. We would hope to reduce that during the treatment with traction. And we'd also expect that uh, following a fracture the leg will grow more quickly than the other side, so it will make up some of that discrepancy.